You know, um, I learned a lot of words since I came to the United States, and one of those words is that word homesick. You know, homesick. Have ever any of you have been homesick? You know what it means? It's like when you have been in that place that you love, and for some reason you need to be far away from there. But then when you go back to that place and you're ready to leave again, you have that desire of trying to absorb as much as possible while you are there. For example, if there is that beautiful view from your balcony, you want to look at that and really just keep that in your head and in your memory because it's going to sustain you. Now, for some of people here in Texas, I know they tend to do this. Like, if they're going to go somewhere out of Texas, let me eat as many water burgers that I, as I can before I get out of here. There is one thing. Who said amen? <laughs> <laughs> Esther, that's in Missouri. No water burgers, right? So um, we need to be sure the bishop stays here for a while. But uh, I remember that city called Texarkana. You know what I'm talking about? There is a water burger in the border. And I remember, even though I was coming from Ohio, that's the first stop we had. The, for me, that's not that, I mean, I like them, but I, I crave way more the tacos al pastor. That, if I translate that is pastor tacos, but that's not a pastor, just so you want you to know. But I have not found any tacos al pastor in San Antonio as that. And that actually is cute because in 945, I received several ideas of where can I go to find them. But if any one of you can tell me, I would absolutely love that for lunch. Abel, would you like to go with me? All right, brother. So I love the tacos al pastor. But now I want to eat. <laughs> but one of the things, too, is that when we have that time and those memories, sometimes what we do is with those close friends. We want to see them. We want to say, if I can just go and give you a hug before I leave, you are going to try to do that because you love them in there. So the scripture that we have today is in a similar place. We're talking about all these prayers of Jesus and different moments when he prayed. This is our very last sermon about prayers of Jesus. Next week, we start with something new called impact and the way we make impact in the world through our lives and how God has made an impact on us. But through these prayers of Jesus, the very last prayer that we learn is about when Jesus is ready to go back to the Father and uh, he's ready in that moment of ascension with all his friends, the disciples. And look what he chooses to do. The scripture says, when he had led them out of, to the vicinity of Bethany, he lifted up his hands and what? Blessed them. That's the very last thing that he chose to do. He didn't choose to go and say, let's go have some tacos al pastor. He didn't choose that one. He didn't choose also to say, where well, you're going to meet here and sing a song. He chose to bless them. And that was intentional. But many times when we talk about that word, to be blessed or blessed, it's easy to get very confused about it. Very confused about it. Like, what does really blessing mean? Because there is a big mistake understanding that you are blessed if you are in a place of prosperity. Have you seen that? So the question is this. So if I have money in my bank account, if I have a good house and everything is fine, I am blessed? Yes or no? Well, I am. But also, if when I don't have money in the bank account, when I don't have my car working well, does that mean that I'm not blessed? No. And that's a big mistake. Sometimes we talk about, and even I confess that sometimes in the way we use the word, we tend to communicate blessing as being prosperous. You see, uh, I remember one guy that I love a lot. His name is Abel Stewart. And I have told you this story before, that I remember his very first car assures you that I love him because of who he is. Because his very first car was a Toyota Corolla from the 1700s, I think. And um, I mean, it, it, we call it the miracle car, actually. I mean, it, and think about this car when it was raining or it was snowing, it won't work. And we were in Kentucky, Ohio, and Kentucky, and then I, in Wilmer. And I remember the car starts like, troca, troca, troca. and it was like, in the name of Jesus, this thing needs to work, and it starts working, right? So I'm like, okay, thank you, Lord, you know. So, but I can tell you that I knew Abel was blessed at that point of his life 
regardless of the car that he had. <laughs> so that does not communicate if you are blessed or not. So we need to be very clear about that difference. There is a reason why it's so easy to get confused in that term, because there is some background that we need to clarify. There is one author who says this very important thing. He says, early prosperity is no longer a mark of God's blessing. Do you get that? So I want you to learn that very well. Earthly prosperity is no longer a mark of God's blessing. That is a very unfair statement if we say to people, unless you have things, then you are blessed. We heard the word of God saying how God was going to bless Abraham with a multitude of, of a, a, a people after him. And many times the confusion is thinking in that multitude as a sign of blessing. But there was a specific purpose for Abraham. Abraham. The purpose was that through him, we were going to be able to receive the blessing of the Lord Jesus Christ. So it is not a mark of God's blessing, the prosperity. So what the scripture, what we learned too is this. The blessing package of a nation racially descended from Abraham living in a prosperous land has been transformed. We do not go just by that anymore in the scripture. That was specifically for a specific reason. There is a difference now. It is in Jesus, by Jesus, into a church from all nations belonging to a heavenly land with heavenly blessings. So it has been transformed to that. Now we understand that a person or when we are blessed is by the fact that through the Lord Jesus Christ, we belong to the church. We belong to the body of Christ. We belong to that specific group called the kingdom of God. I love this scripture on Ephesians where it says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. So what it means is that we are blessed because God has been now part of our story. We are blessed by the transformation that God has given to all of us. We even say that in the scripture and in the Lord's prayer. There is a moment when we say, thy kingdom come. That is part of that kingdom. Now, when we talk about the kingdom of God, is it something that is just happening in the future when we die? No. When does the kingdom of God start? It's now through the Lord Jesus Christ. So what happened is you and I are part of that kingdom of God. We have been part of that when we understood what is our position with God. We were transformed by the presence of God. There were times probably in your life and mine where we were trying to find meaning and we look for different sources of meaning. And some of those sources, instead of helping, they hurt us. And it is when we came to the Lord Jesus Christ, when we understood that when we were before his feet and we came and brought our sins, our mistakes, we brought those things, things that have hurt us because of other people doing wrong to us. And when we brought that to the Lord, he took that and he said, it is done. And I'm giving you the opportunity of a new life. And I give you the opportunity to hear what is really the value of your life. And it is so easy that before we confuse our value, for me probably that was one of the struggles. I had a hard time understanding that my life had a value regardless if I did something or not. I thought that my life had a value according to how much I can do. Has it happened to you? And it's just about doing and doing because you think that's how my life has a value. But it was a moment when the Lord interrupted me. And many times he does that. He stops me, literally stops me and shows me and says, you know, your value is not coming by what you can do or cannot do. Actually, I'm not letting you do anything right now. So you know that you have a value even in that moment for me. Because the value doesn't come by action. The value is because of the gift that God provides to us that we become their children. So when we get that, when we understand that and we live that experience, we become part of the kingdom of God. And by that, then we become a source of communication to others about that wonderful kingdom of God.
we are here to proclaim that with others, the kingdom of God. So in that case, why to bless? Why do we do this? There is one scripture that actually explains that very well, and that's in Ezekiel. And we have talked about this before. It's about learning to stand in the gap. And Ezekiel is, is telling us about this, and this is a very common um, illustration for the people in the Old Testament. At that time when the cities were surrounded by walls, whenever there was a big battle, the main captain, what he will do is he will send the best soldiers to those gaps in the walls. So he will be very sure that anything that could come through that, they will need to confront the very best uh, soldiers so they will be protecting the territory and the, the, the city of that place. So in Ezekiel, what God is saying and doing is he's asking, is there anyone who's willing to stand in the gap? And there God is talking about spiritual gap. He was talking about how the people of God were distracted and they were looking at other gods and to the point that the, the presence of God wasn't there anymore. So he was looking, is there anyone willing to stand in the gap? to be able to be in communication with God, listening to God, connecting with God, and then through that connecting and helping the people that were in that city. So when we are called to bless, we are called to stand in the gap and we get to a very sacred space. We, you and I, members of the church of the Lord, we are in that specific place where we listen to God where we are trying to follow him, when we know about him, and then we, through that, we bless others so they can be part of the kingdom of God too. There is this very good definition here. Blessing is a public, uh, publicly, publicly verbalized statement of one's good intentions toward another, but coupled with authority. So it's not just good desires, as if you were dealing with um, Barney, the purple dinosaur. You know, he's happy and he wants you to be happy. It's not about that. There is an authority in there. So there is another aspect on this definition. That is, blessings that are spoken without authority, what are they? Empty words. You can be saying a lot of great desires. I can tell to some of you, I hope that you will be rich. I hope that you will be thin. I hope that you will be fat. I hope that you will have a lot of money. I hope, I mean, we can hope anything, but that really has nothing to do if it's just say without any authority. Now, blessings that have authority but remain unspoken are no more than private intentions. So there could be moments when you say, I know God is asking me to say a blessing to this person, but I'm not going to say it. What does that person feel? If God sent you to do that, you're interrupting a blessing in there. You're interrupting where God can come and totally change the life of that person. The person needs to be conscious about that blessing. Publicly spoken blessings with God's authority, that's the mix you need to speak it, but also God's authority needs to come with you. With that power, they are not magic, but they grant God's hand full license to move and act while still respecting the public authority structures of human community. In other words, God puts us as a church to be able to communicate to others his blessings. So whenever you have the opportunity to tell a person, I'm going to bless you, God bless you, and God is putting that in your heart, you need to obey. Bless the person. I constantly do that, and I'm trying, my kids tell me, Mom, do you need to bless everyone? And I'm like, yes. Why? Because I believe that, I, I mean, this is one of the best things that we can provide to a person. I feel that when we do that, we're interrupting the devil on that person. We're interrupting any conversation that that person could have in their head, getting confused. And in the moment that you say, I bless you, you become an interruption for that person to start saying, okay, wait, let me think. What are you talking about? And it's an opening for God to be able to speak in there. So how many times do we need to do that? As often as we can. So that is standing in the gap. Jesus blessed his disciples in a way that honor and breach both human and divine authority structures. So you put those two together. 
This very extensive uh, definition came from this author, Reverend Abel Stewart. I don't know if many of you know, but he became, he's becoming a deacon. So now that's why he's becoming the Rev Stewart in, in the house. So anyway, but that's, that's what it means. It means that you are that connection. This is how I see it too. I see that we are part of the kingdom of God. And here is God, and then there is the church. Raise your hand if you're a part of the church, all right? Raise your hand if you're a part of the church and you like tacos. Oh, yeah, I'm in the right church. Thank you, Bishop. Okay, you know, and then we have people. So how does this work? God, in Jesus Christ, he says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. So in Jesus, he's receiving that authority, but he's also giving that authority to us. And we need to accept that authority. Because after that, what Jesus is telling us is make disciples. So how do we start making disciples? There are times when we're not going to be able to go with one person and have a long conversation and connection to be able to say, I'm going to walk the person from zero of knowing God all the way to make them a strong disciple. There are times when it's not going to happen like that. So what do I do? I see the blessings are kind of sparks of light. When you start blessing people, you're bringing that spark of light to their life in a way that the person starts somehow allowing the Spirit of God coming and transforming the life of that person. So whenever you go to McDonald's and you get that Diet Coke and you say, God bless you, you're putting a light in there. Whenever you are shopping and you find that person in the Walmart and you say, God bless you, you're going to make a blessing in there. You know, there is a person in this church. Her name is Debbie Harold, And I know she's here, but I'm going to embarrass her. One time I was shopping and I did, she didn't realize that I was behind her. And I was uh, in the moment when we're paying with the cashier. And I could see the cashier. And at the beginning, that cashier was looking just, you know, she was just doing her job not caring or whatever. But here comes Debbie. And if you are close to Debbie, you can sense that that lady is holy for two reasons. It's because it's evident that she has a connection with God. And the second is because she has needed to live her life with Mr. Dudley always. And that's just if you're holy, you can survive that. And uh, amen. I'm just <laughs> Okay. So one of the things that happened is She's talking to this cashier, and I don't even know, Debbie, that you realize that. But as soon as you start talking to her and just smiling to her and just your presence of blessing that lady, that lady changed. So whenever I needed to pay, that lady was in the best spirit ever. I received the consequence of that blessing. You know, like she was in the best place. I saw in front of my eyes a transformation of personality just by the presence of a person willing to bless others. So what if it happens with all of us? How many people we can impact if we do all of that together? I see this in this other way. In Texas, if somebody tells you, I'm going to give you a splash of water. What do we feel? I mean, if it was in Ohio in November, you start cursing that person for sure. Right? Because like, ah, why are you putting? But in Texas, bring it on. The more, the merrier. Because it's so hot that you want all the water you can because it's so warm. You love that splash. That's how I see blessings. It's just that splash of God's grace that you give to a person. Is that splash of reminding to a person your life has a value. Is that splash that the person can have that maybe what is going on in his brain or her brain is, how am I going to make it today? And you, by blessing that person, you remind them, there is that God that I can come and can rescue me. Maybe there will be times when you give that splash and you transform the next action of that person. And through that, we make an impact of the kingdom of God.